So welcome, Suzanne Newcomb, to the Keenan Yoga uh, podcast. Um, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having a chat with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. So um, we have a few things we want to talk on. And the first one was um, just how we ended up with the modern yoga class. Um, and particularly, um, um, I know that Suzanne's done a bunch of research on uh, yoga in the UK and how it's developed over uh, the last, say, 100 years. So this is what attracted me, first of all, to Suzanne's work as a scholar on modern yoga and many other things. Um, so, yeah, do you want to just kick off and, and trace some influences maybe on the on the <laughs> on the, on the UK? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a small question. You know, it's a, yeah. There's lots of different ways you can approach it and different scholars have approached okay. it in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I find that one of the, the really interesting things about studying in general and, and something I I tried to do when I did a, a more recent edited book, the Rutledge Handbook of Yoga and Meditation Studies, was just look at how our disciplinary interests and what how we define what yoga is really changes the story. So I, I, I just saying that at the moment because there's lots of ways the story could be told that are true in different contexts or if you're looking at different currents, say. Um, but what I've really spent a lot of time looking at are two things. One is um, how yoga was popularized in Britain, um, which I think was particularly influential globally because of it being the center of an English speaking empire. And um, obviously at the point where yoga, modern yoga classes developed, the empire was no more, but the trade networks, the, the people were still moving all around the world. And the yoga teachers who came to Britain went to South Africa, they went to Australia, they went not to some extent to America, but it, it really was global, um, which is very interesting. And a, a lot of, early American works on the history of yoga have emphasized the impact of the American Immigration Act, which restricted the movement of Asian peoples. But really, on the other side of the world, it was completely the opposite. And it was just a matter of, of money, um, because all Indians were effectively British subjects, and they had the right to travel mm. throughout the empire if they could come up with the funds until a bit later mm. in the 70s, when, when immigration became much more restricted. Um, so yeah modern yoga classes um <laughs> where do i start who was a, i mean like just for just to make it you know kind of give a little bit of a starting place who was the kind of first kind of people to introduce the the you know the asana based yoga class to to the uk well there are a few things happening in the first half of the 20th century um the main ones were um yoga asana being part of the physical culture movement so you had magazines like health and strength which were they were bodybuilding but they were also kind of health and wellness and they had lots of advice about um, diets and your mental hygiene and your sex life um and so there, there were these kind of slightly alternative holistic um self-improvement magazines and there were some indian teachers promoting asana as physical culture which is a lot of what was happening in india at that time um as part of the, the nationalist struggle and, and creating strong indian bodies um so there is that mm -hmm. element there are also some interesting correspondence courses so there was a chap called desmond dunn who was teaching yogism um and i'm not entirely sure where he was getting it from there are, there are a lot of self-taught yogis um uh some other people have done a bit of research on him but he's a bit mysterious i found some of his correspondence courses which are um are very interesting um they uh idealize sleeping animals as the ideal kind of yoga posture it's like your cat sleeping um in utter relaxation huh. and they do a lot of kind of nolly and um breath exercises that you don't find in modern posture classes um and they also he also has this idea at that point um he, he kind of comes on board to the regular modern yoga classes later um that western bodies and eastern bodies are fundamentally different and the same things aren't suitable for each and that attitude hmm. it, you find quite a lot in the early 20th century and then it really shifts after the second world war um so after the Second World War, you start getting more the the posture classes we're familiar with now. Um, and I think where you're leading to me towards is the adult education classes, which has been a, kind of a central argument. But I don't know. Do you want me to talk about something else before that? Or 
Yes, I reckon before that. I mean, because you have interesting things to say about, you know, other, other, other influences coming over. We mentioned in a previous chat, Paul Brunton as an influence for yoga generally and how it was taken up, you know, because Absolutely. I think, you know, it's important for um, what people are realizing now is that as yoga came over, you know, it, it changed quite a lot, you know, from what it was over the channel, over the channel, as it were, to where it came, you know, and then docked in, you know, in the UK. And, and, one, and, and you, you point out the UK was one of the first places that obviously because it was, it had this, um, you know, particular past with India, <laughs> that, uh, you know, it had this uh, engagement with yoga uh, as one of the first places that it landed. And so what happened in England was uh, formative as well for, you know, for, for a broader public. Um, so you talk about the yeah, figures, so um, Paul Brunson, maybe, uh, Krishna, um, Krishna Murthy, maybe. Um, what, uh, what about um, Christmas Humphreys? I remember him, talk, he talks about yoga and then Alan Watts gets on board. So there's earlier figures that in the Theosophical Society. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. Okay, so the Theosophical Society um, was hugely important. And we tend to, there's been a lot of uh, interesting academic research looking at that very recently. But in general, we tend to kind of think of them as 19th century crackpots, which is really unfair because at the time they were at the cutting edge of yeah, um, yeah, yeah. thinking about alternative religion and science to some extent, even though um, they Blavatsky herself was um, kind of proved as a fraud and Ledbetter has lots of scandals associated with him, um, much like modern yoga gurus today. But what was really amazing about the Theosophical Society was this, um, uh, this is before, way before the internet, um, and they had reading rooms and they had lecture series and they were really interested in bringing people together to explore and talk about um, all sorts of non-Christian ways of looking at the world. And it was a really creative space that attracted lots of intelligent, forward-thinking people. And it was also the heyday of something called the Society for Psychical Research, which was quite involved with debunking Blavatsky eventually. But um, uh, it, it was about the kind of human potential. It was, a, it was an early human potential movement. Um, and I think it, it does a real disservice to... Um, not understand how really um, cosmopolitan and forward thinking a lot of people involved with the Theosophical Society were. So mm. the, the Theosophical Society had um, networks of bookshops. They had um, uh, Watkins Bookshop, which originally was in Charing Cross Road, which is in the, the, the center of London and, and book shopping. And that was where was it moved? Book. Um, it's, it's still on Cecil Court. It's just off. Yes. Um, oh, right. So it moved off, off yeah. Cecil Court, just off Charing Court Road, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 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 So, uh, um, I thought I'd no, been away too long. No, no still, uh, still around no. that area. Okay. No, yeah. no. Yeah. Although there's so much new changes, it kind of threatens to be knocked over at some point. Anyway. Um, I'm sure it will be. Yeah. So, yeah, Watkins Bookstore um, was run by theosophists who imported the translations that the Theosophical Society was doing in India. So the first translations of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the Shiva Samhita, those are all produced by the Theosophical Society. And some of my colleagues um, in particularly in Vienna, like Julian Strube and Carl Bayer, have done really interesting work on the Indian collaborators and um, Kenneth Kantu as well. Um, and it was this was a really complex and interesting entanglement of Indians and um, the Westerners. It, it, it's it still needs a lot more unpacking to understand what was going mm. on with those translations. Anyway, but these were the first Indian texts that appeared, and you could get and their books. So they were accessible to middle class, educated people, forward thinking people. They weren't for the man on the street yet. Um, and the lecture theaters they had reading rooms in their societies where they had all sorts of literature and they had lectures so an early proponent of yoga who came over was this chap called Hari Prasad Shastri who taught a kind of more Vaita Vedanta um, uh, philosophical yoga and he starts teaching in the theosophical um, uh, milieus in the 1920s and he, he builds up the small Shanti Sadan which is a, a kind of organization that lasts until it's still existent today but it, it kind of comes in and out of the counterculture and he wrote a uh, a primer on yoga for another bookstore um, on Sharon Cross Road, Foyle's books, um, 
mm. later in the 60s. Um, so anyway, we're talking uh, originally about 1920s as a period of time when, when it, you know, first really see yoga being introduced into a, in the, the broad kind of popular consciousness of, of uh, Great Britain. Um, you say the kind some, of 1920s kind of or before elite, that? In elite circles a bit earlier, and you had right. Alistair Crowley um, oh, even yes. in the um, 19, I think he, his, his book four was like 1913. And you can see adverts for that in the Theosophical journals. And so you would write in, it, it looks very interesting, and you'd write into the address, and then you could correspond directly with Crowley, and he might um, encourage you to keep a diary um, and, and start his practices, which is in fact what um, Gerald York did, who was this in, incredible um, influential publisher of books um, on anything to do with religion in Asia in the 20th century. Um, but he was initially a, a kind of disciple of Crowley and he practiced yoga based on Crowley's methods in a Welsh cave for a while. Um, and he, he's very interesting, um, both that he, he published, he was involved in publishing um, Yusudian and H's. No, he, he didn't publish that, but he, he, he was very much involved in light on yoga. And a lot yeah. of the translations of Buddhist sutras, um, the first editions of the um, Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, um, Evans yeah. Welch, and he worked with um, lots of people on this crossover. He considered himself a Buddhist. Um, and yeah, sorry, I'm just rambling. No, not at all. I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, because there's so many kind of roots coming into, you know, which you don't realise that kind of set a certain kind of precedence and groundwork into what we're doing today you know and obviously we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the 60s and bks yengo and he came over and he as you mentioned had a relationship with watkins and they shaped him a lot or at least they shaped light on yoga a lot i believe um so there's people behind the scenes that have had a lot of influence i mean what how does it relate to what was happening in india do you know was there any crossover obviously krishnamurti was kind of plucked from india a kind of somewhat anglicized in 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 the you know in what they were doing you have sir john woodroff you know writing you know uh, serpent power in, in you know as a judge in india right as i believe and other you know in, in, in other indigenous indian practitioners that are, m must be also coming over to uk no yeah there definitely were some like i mentioned shastri and mm -hmm. uh, krishnamurti was fascinating um in that he he was the center of this um prophecy of the theosophical society <laughs> which then he renounced and yeah. so during the theosophical period um i think it was 1927 but I might be slightly wrong when, when he Around that time, his, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. His status. Do, do look it up. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then he kind of drops out for the, until the end of the Second War period in terms of the kind of, um, uh, say, cultic milieu of these alternative thinking because he went to America and had his own, mm. his own system. But then he comes back as this really huge influence in the 1960s um, with his own teachings. Um, and he has interactions with Iyengar as well, which I think were quite um, profound on Iyengar's development. Um, that's my personal opinion. Other people mm. might not agree with that. Um, <laughs> but back to the question of India, I'm really not the expert here, but um, from what other colleagues have um, said, I think the and, and their research reveals, like if you go to India, you'll notice there's lots of Anibasant roads and lots of um, the, the names of the Theosophical Society figures are in the infrastructure of India and the Theosophical Society in India, I think was really involved in improving education and the nationalist movements. And it, it had this very kind of self-improvement political focus within India and didn't have the, the such strong associations with kind of esoteric whackery that it got in, uh, <laughs> in yeah, Britain yeah, at least. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the same fundamental ideas, I mean, I think we don't talk about them because in large, in large extent, they won um, the the idea of of thinking about truth being found throughout the world's traditions and not something unique in Europe or Christianity, and the the Theosophical Society had its own has its own um, interesting theology that's much more restrictive than that. But but that kind of broad broadening out, um, I think, really became the norm by the end of the twentieth century. Um, yeah, so I was going to say, well, I mean, because they were influential, but as you mentioned, then they kind of kind of discredited and dismissed as Ledbetter gets into, you know, scandalous territory and Blavatsky is just, uh, you know, revealed as a bit of a fraud with her letters or, or Annie Besant, you know, uh, who, I don't know who had the letters, so, the auto writing letters flying from the ceiling. That, that was Blavatsky, you know, yeah. Was there Blavatsky, right? Okay. So, yeah, 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 but they did, they were formative and I think it's important to recognise their, you know, their influence, right? 
So then some of the influence comes through, as you were mentioning, Paul Bronson, who wrote this incredible book, A Search and Secret India. And Great book. Um, he was a, originally in the Theosophical Milieus, and he set up um, another really influential bookshop um, with, Ooh, I'm blocking on his name at the moment, um, but the Atlantis Bookshop, which is also on Museum Street. And that turned a more Western esoteric magical bent, um, and that's still in existence. Um, but Brunton, so he was in these kind of esoteric theosophical milieus, and um, he went to India and um, was was searching for his guru. And he wasn't the first British person to do this, um, but he wrote in a really engaging way um and he was the first person to probably popularize the ramana marishi um in the 1930s and this is important because he did it in the in kind of periodicals to start with and then in this book and it becomes one of the key books of the 60s along with um uh lord of the rings probably <laughs> and inspiring seekers and, and people on the um the the kind of path to india um the the overground path the early overground path to india um but th this idea that you can um find legitimate true teachers paul Brunton, um yeah so his, his book was um consistently quoted in the 1960s and 70s in the the journals of the wheel of british yoga in particular as one of the key texts that brought people into yoga practice and so Although there were these physical in the in the nineteen sixties, which I'm sure we're going to get to, and then in the seventies, yeah. there was this yeah. emphasis on the physical practice. A lot of people came to it through these books, um, which were more about a, a, a esoteric personal search for an inner truth. Um, yeah. and there was no and, asana, so, as I remember, of the journey of Secret, Secret India. No, I don't think he talked about asana no. at all, did he? No, it's great no. book though. I'd highly it, recommended. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. quite a good read. Um, yeah. he, he was an interesting kind of problematic guru figure he's got a, a, a foundation in um new york that's pr preserving his writings but um he's got some defectors he he thought there was going to be a, a third world war and convinced people to move to argentina at one point um long after the maharishi right. stuff yeah um, <laughs> but um no it's a good book um much better than some of the other stuff floating around like Lob Sang rampa um i don't know if you've you've heard of him he was a, no, a taxi no. driver who um <laughs> thought he was an incarnation of a, a, a buddhist monk um and then he claimed that actually he was just the reincarnation of a buddhist monk and he was kind of debunked in britain but moved to canada and has a small following there still as right. you do yeah <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so 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 on the one hand, I'm, I'm talking about an, another one of my academic interests are these new religious figures. Um, but yeah, seriously, yeah. the the Theosophical influence and Christmas Humphreys. So Christmas Humphreys was the founder of the Buddhist Society, and he yeah. was one of the key figures in mainstreaming and making respectable Buddhism in Britain. Mm. And there was this mm. kind of divide between Buddhism is a philosophy; it's not a religion, and therefore it's okay and respectable whereas hinduism kind of has these associations with paganism and mm. sex and mm. disrespectable things Tantra. Mm -mm. yeah mm. um so christmas humphreys was originally a theosophist and then he broke away and kind of founded this ecumenical buddhist society which had a focus on texts um and a lot of initially kind of poly polytex um but it's still it's still in existence still is quite respectable and has this kind mm. of broad um broad base of promoting buddhism and accurate more more um philological study of buddhism than than we had with yoga traditions now well, one of the interesting things about um the intertwined history of yoga and buddhism in britain is um I've, I've not published on all this yet, but I've been through a lot of the correspondence um, with Gerald York, who, as I said, was this important publishing person, and he was close with Christmas Humphreys, but really decried um, Humphreys' kind of theosophical slant on Buddhism and argued that he, he, he was presenting this theosophical Buddhism, not the, not the authentic Buddhism. And in his publishing decisions, he was really looking for people who had personal experience of practice. He didn't want these theoretical a kind of Paul Brunton stories, um, although Brunton was a practitioner as well. But the, the Search and Secret India was was not so much of a serious practitioner. But York was really seeking out people who who 
walked the walk and that they were talking um, and wanted to shift things towards what he saw as more authentic people with um, lived um, embodied experience of Eastern traditions and that, that this is what um, what was needed rather than a theosophical um, kind of mixing up of, of different mm. traditions. Mm. So was there any crossover between what was happening in the UK and what was happening in the US? You have, uh, you know, Theos Bernard and, and these figures that are similar in the kind of guru elk. And they've been allegedly they've been to India and had these mystical experiences like Brunton. Right. And they kind of seem to be doing a similar thing on the other side of the channel. Do you, you know, is there a relationship or a contrast between the two? What's going on in both England and the US at the, That's at the same really time? That's a really good question. Um, and the biggest crossover is a chap called Paul Dukes, who is a, a child of empire. And he was. Um, uh, a spy in the Bolshevik um, revolution, um, kind of unwittingly, he, he had gone to Russia because he, he was interested in that. And he has this tale of meeting a kind of Gurdjieffian figure. But he mm. connects with, um, he then after the, the kind of 1920s, he goes to Pierre, Pierre Bernard's um, Nyack Center and learns yoga there. Um, and uh, he marries a, an heiress who he later divorces and um but he he was the first person to teach yoga on british television um in 1949 on the bbc um and he wrote a few books on yoga and he taught in obviously taught in england but then he went to south africa for quite a lot and i think he also went to australia and new zealand and so what ex where exactly he got his yoga from mm. um uh is an interesting question he also traveled to india later um but it's it's very likely influenced by pierre bernard's um teachings in the 1920s in new york um were they doing asana there in, in the us earlier than we were doing it in the uk it seems like theos and pierre were, to, were they released their hatha yoga books and it was much more kind of physically based right is that correct and it comes later and we get this asana in the uk I think that yoga in the US is quite difficult to um, research because there's so many different pockets of it. Um, mm. It's such a vast country. What um, my colleague um, Philip Dislip has found, though, in looking at the newly digitized um, newspaper records, is that it was actually there's a swami circuit of traveling um, Indians who got stranded by the Immigration Act and were giving lectures to theaters of um kind of the wonders of india and offering kind of private sessions to women in hotel rooms afterwards which wasn't always taken well um <laughs> and so this is that was, US, that was very yeah, much right, yeah. this is in the yeah. us yeah, yeah yeah and so that that was very much not asana um but there there were also i mean when people could there, there were things like um uh the the other physical culture movements i'm forgetting anya foxen's work on yeah, yeah, um yeah. uh th that kind of asana came in sideways and in britain that was the um league of health and beauty um and you, you found asana and other physical practices um so i guess w one of the important things i i've taken from my study of the history of yoga and how did modern yoga classes get to be is that there's no one Hmm. There's no one linear tradition or, or way it had to turn out the way it did. It's just like the soup of people who who find interesting ideas and interesting practices. And and they're often quite authentic in their search for trying to understand and practice them. Um, but they all have their own slants, their own influences, their own different interpretations. And it it's kind of coalesced into, on the one hand, what we see is this fairly standard um 21st century neoliberal yoga class that's done in a rented central location with fairly standard bendy white women um but on the other hand all these weird esoteric um subcultures are still there and there's new weird esoteric subcultures and so you've got um uh, like the chemic yoga of of the ancient Egyptian yoga that seems to have appeared in the last few years, which was an, another oh, really? interesting theosophical connection. Um, <laughs> I'm just going off so with still, tangents. No, I just <laughs> assumed that they, everything had been kind of subsumed into the kind of 
modern yoga thrust in the UK. So there's still these little pockets of traditional other stuff going on, is there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Like the Shanti Sudan's still there. Yeah. Yoga Ramdev's got his own like clique of um, uh, retired diasporic Indians who teach for free um, in this kind of... But they're, they're, it's just what you have to be in... You have to look for them. If you if you just like Google yoga, you're going to come up with a neoliberal yoga studio. But if you if you go in through a subculture... You'll find that most of these organizations, they might be quite little now, but they're still there in some form. <laughs> and when did it really start to kick off the asana stuff? I mean, you were going to go on to that much earlier on in terms of the <clears throat> 1950s, 60s. Yeah, uh, we have this thing, if, you don't, if you're not listening from Great Britain, called the British Wheel of Yoga. That's how I started yoga. I got in, got in with this British Wheel of Yoga. And even in the 1990s, it was kind of the domain of a slightly older lady who was often a nurse or at least, a, you know, like there's a certain kind of person who was involved in the British wheel. It was very English as well. Um, Absolutely. And then obviously, yeah, BKS Yenga comes in slightly around the, the inventor of the British wheel of yoga. Anyway, you probably know a lot more about me, same, same me about this. So, yeah. um, I'll start with that. Uh, Paul Dukes on British on the BBC in 1949, 19, 1950. And I wasn't able to view this, um, footage i don't think it was saved but they had written um records of audience responses to this um and it, it was firmly decided that that this was not the time to introduce yoga and that <sighs> um the way that dukes put his arm around the ballerina demonstrators was um too too much and um too oh, salacious God. for for yeah. the british home audience so it needed a good long rest i think was the phrase used by the bbc in the archives and it did get a good long rest <laughs> and you didn't get much in the 1950s but you got the slow slow books um it's a brilliant turn of phrase as well of physical culture yeah. Yeah. um yeah. movement um and then the the what really kicked it off was this woman called Yogini Sunita, who got into the British Athletics Institute in the early 1960s. And her um, her birth name was Bernadette Cabral. And she teaches, you can still find her teaching online. It's called Pranayama Yoga. Um, and some of the teachers she worked with are still trying to, but it's very small. But in the 1960s, she had a very popular class with hundreds of people in Birmingham at the Athletics Institute. And Birmingham was a really interesting multicultural city that was at the forefront of a lot of reforms in terms of looking at um, respecting different cultures that from the empire that came into Britain. And there was this real, real transfer of understanding between I also do work on religious education and how religious studies is taught in Britain. But there was this real transfer in Birmingham um, in the 1960s between um, religious education, which is a mandatory um, subject in British schools, um, being for kind of moral and personal development in a Christian sense. And Birmingham, um, Ninian Spartan, the Birmingham education syllabus shifted that to a more um, religious education should reflect the diversity of the community and the the diversity of the world's religions, which kind of set up its own problems, which we're now dealing with. But it was really for, for at the forefront of um, mm. Uh, a lot of things Birmingham was in the 1960s. Why, why, was, why was that particularly? Just because there was such a big diaspora of um, Indian yeah, nationals coming so. to Birmingham, particularly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Sunita Cabral is um, she? She was like I said, she was um, an named Bernadette uh, Cabral in India. She she lives in the outskirts of Mumbai, um, then Bombay. She was very westernized. I think English was her first language. She worked in the Italian embassy before she moved and her husband got a job involving uh, printmaking, I think, in the Birmingham area. And that's why they moved. And when she first came over in the interviews uh, she gave to newspapers, she talked about um, how she tried to make a living as a piano teacher, but nobody wanted an Indian piano teacher. Um, and so then she started teaching yoga and everybody wanted an Indian yoga teacher. Um, and so she started dressing in saris. And I, I don't think it was inauthentic, but it was just like a, a different aspect of who she was. And um, she was very, uh, she taught asana based yoga. It, if you find her, her books online, um, she did a lot of lotus positions, a lot of bending knee positions. It was a flowing sequence, but it looks really unlike anything you see in a modern clip class today in general that the photographs you see but she was absolutely insistent that it was um open for any anyone of any religion and 
um, it, it was a spiritual practice, but it wasn't a religious practice. And that was really important in the publicly funded mm. um, classes in Britain in the 1960s and 70s, was that um, public funds could not be used to promote an Indian religion, um, but they could be used for health and well-being. And mm. um, yoga was seen as a way to, to promote that. Um, I mean, and that was in the early 60s, right, <laughs> that she was coming over and, and yeah, absolutely. popularizing it this way. And so... Well, um, Wilfred Clark yeah. and the British Wheel of Yoga were also in Birmingham in the early 1960s. And he um, was a fascinating figure, very influential. He considered himself a Buddhist. Um, and he, in his interviews, he claimed to be introduced to yoga um, during his service in World War I with Indian servicemen who talked about the Bhagavad Gita and, and fortitude in the face of battle. Um, and then he has this kind of really um, varied career as a amateur actor and newspaper editor. and in this pre-internet times again what 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 he did was he had a, a caravan at the bottom of his um garden in Solihull and he um sent out notices to local newspapers and said are you interested in yoga write to me and then he'd like send out a newsletter to them and this was all based on fairly correspondence I think he took an Oxford correspondence course in Indian religions and kind of pieced together what he could um and then and then he'd find like oh look there's three people in um in west yorkshire we should put them together so he'd, he'd kind of do this networking and yeah. and then he'd send them his newsletters um and he he was really um decried the the way that yogini sunita was part of the athletics institute and he thought this is the wrong place for yoga yoga was primarily a philosophy and during the 60s and 70s he in the, in the newsletters of the british wheel which were first these kind of carbon copied typed things and then were kind of more professionally done and it was built up slowly through these networks um they recommended reading like paul brunton um and he thought that yoga was um a quarter philosophy a quarter meditation a quarter relaxation and a quarter physical exercises and should be taught in the philosophy departments right. um and he he, he oh, built how up it's this changed yeah amazing um, yeah. network that way <laughs> And, and there was this, you were talking about how English it was. There was this kind of argument early on about, is it the wheel of British yoga or the British wheel of yoga? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it was a definitely a, an autodidactic um, English um, and really genuine seeking, um, trying to figure mm. out what we could take from um the practices and beliefs of largely India and um and how, how to apply them to to make a meaningful life um in the contemporary world I mean he's really into that you mentioned also I mean also <laughs> in terms of BKS I know it was important that he kind of got into the institutionalized kind of funded system right is that was that important at the time in the uk i mean w was it important yeah, to be uh, recognized as part of the established uh kind of you know institutionalized systems so this is like pre pre neoliberal you couldn't just rent a, a shop front and teach yoga really? um, if you're going to teach yoga um well no one you could i suppose no one did you usually had to have a rich bank a backer so like the shanti sedan had a, a kind of a, a house or a, a but they tended to be more libraries but the, so the the first um yoga studio that was called the yoga studio that i know was um uh, stella scherfless's um and she was taught by paul dukes in south africa um and she had a kind of off manchester square in central london someone rented a property for her um and that was the kind of mid 60s she did that um that was that was very unusual and it was quite hard to make a, a living doing that as it still is anyway mm. bks Iyengar. so um uh the thing was yogini sunita was really popular um and birmingham was happy with her they knew her personally the british wheel of yoga was lobbying hard for all these local education centers to to introduce yoga classes um and the the local education would be held in like school buildings in the evenings and for a fairly small fee you could um uh brush up on all sorts of things you could learn typing you could learn sewing you could learn um flower arranging they tended to be very yeah. gendered um and 
and so physical education and um, the well, the physical well-being was something that came out of the Second World War and the social welfare state in that it was important to make sure the population was physically well. Um, hmm. And this was the start of the NHS. So, so hmm. yoga was partially introduced in this kind of environment. Um, so the, the local education authorities have this problem, like there's no certification in yoga. How do you know if a yoga teacher is any good? How do you know if they're going to be safe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, and so that's why the certification system came in in Britain. And Yogini Sunita unfortunately died before she institutionalized her teaching into a, a way to te train other yoga teachers within that system. Um, and what really pushed it on was when BKS Iyengar was recognized by the Inner London Education Authority as being the only recognized guru to certify teachers of yoga um, within mm. the whole Inner London network, which of course was very influential. Um, and this came about um, partially because um, Light on Yoga had been published um, and partially because of the initiative of Peter McIntosh, who was a, um, a really important um, light in the revival of physical culture. He was involved with um, the revival of the Olympic Games um, and he really saw physical culture in its ancient Grecian ideal as like part of the whole person. So although he wanted yoga in the PE departments, he saw it as more than just physical, um, that, that the development of the physical body was a spiritual um, aspiration. <clears throat> so he, um, he ran into, in these elite networks, um, Iyengar had been brought over by Yehudi Menuhin, the virtuoso violinist mm. who was um, really well known in the mid 20th century. It appeared on television and through Menuhin's connections um, secured a book contract for Light on Yoga, which Gerald York kind of was the midwife for and did a lot of um, revisions for. So that came out in 66. In 1969, he got this um, exclusive deal with the Inner London Education Authority. And he was only coming over once a year for a few months. So he developed syllabuses of asana that he... Um, then deputized to people who he had been teaching for five years and hmm. he really created the standardized this is the these are the postures you introduce to beginners in a safe way that's not going to cause injury um and it was quite drill like um and there, there was always a fair amount of complaints about this from particularly the british wheel um but um, it was reproducible, it was clear, um, and it satisfied authorities that people were not going to unduly injure people. Do you think that he was influenced as he came over to Britain by what he found in terms of the classes and, and the way that people were treating him in Britain? I mean, I know that, for example, Light on Yoga had the rev revisions that he, <laughs> Yenga claims that he wouldn't have put in all the benefits of the postures and make, make it more of a kind of yoga therapy book, which is what it turns out as you know so do you, i mean just like vivekananda was also unduly influenced by his influences when he came over from america um yes i, I mean i don't think um i've been looking more through the co correspondence of publishing um between york and Iyengar and the, the process of publishing for both light on yoga and light on pranayama and i think that although Iyengar is undoubtedly an amazing genius in his performance and precision of asana and in his interceptive exploration what came out was collaborative it it, it really was um uh in dialogue with the, with the people he was um mm. trying to communicate with and it came out in its particular way because he was trying to communicate something um so i don't think the um so so there's parts of he definitely said wait, so, okay um when Iyengar came to Britain he some of the descriptions of his first um demonstrations um organized by the Asian Music Circle which was a kind of group of friends with Yehudi Menuhin and he was Menuhin was doing a lot trying to bring over Indian music and Ravi Shankar and he introduced um the Asian Music Circle introduced um, George Harrison to Ravi Shankar. So there was this in the in the nineteen sixties counterculture, which comes after this and intertwines interestingly with this. Um, that there are overlaps, um, uh, but uh, um, so 
I think are the the physical interest in um and the the list of um cures for each asana i think that comes from india i don't think that was um hmm. in position at all with the hmm. british context i don't think he had any contact with the way other people were doing yoga he was always very idiosyncratic this is my system i'm doing it my way um uh the 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 way light on yoga is formatted i think is more based on say the shiva samhita and some of the um the indian canon which was um through the influence of one of his indian collaborator uh tarpur wala um who was in in bombay and helped him with the first copies of the manuscripts and then this this manuscript and the photo photos that were arranged within india um uh were shown to menuhin whose assistants typed them out um and then this manuscript was passed to gerald york and then gerald york um uh brought in a more academic knowledge and a knowledge of what english people could digest mm. um and so i think a lot of the the way things are phrased um and the the kind of um universalization um in the introduction i think had a lot of york's influence on it um what the inner london education authority did was um uh said that we don't want any religious language in the inner london physical education classes you can teach the techniques of asana you can teach the techniques of pranayama um and before this point ainger was mixing it up more um from what i can tell in the the kind of descriptions of what he he was mixing up things from the bhagavad gita and then he said okay i want to popularize yoga um i can i can teach people yoga without using those words no problem um and and that's that's kind of where some of the what's now seen as like extreme secularization mm. um came from but it it wasn't necessarily seen as such a compromise at the time it was like we can, we can get the message out there we can teach um uh kind of moral parables and the yamas and the yamas through how we do asana without ever saying um vishnu or hanuman or anything that scares english people off <laughs> So the mm. we say the roots of the modern yoga class were set by BKS Yenger or were there mm. other influences coming over as well that you could you could think of to mention? Oh, there are definitely other influences. Um I think that the this um, I really do think the standard asana based class was really um developed because of this re- reproducible at a distance format that I think it developed mm. and people and and also fit into pre-existing physical education classes. And I think that to some extent was adopted by other the expectations of people were adopted by other schools, but there were loads of other influences. Um those were the predominant ones in Britain, but Shivananda um teachers came over. That's a very interesting story in the late um 60s. You also had um Musmuri's Gandalf's Garden, which was a fascinating place and he influenced mantra um uh yoga as mantra and it was a kind of a later day um what's uh, happening on on Chelsea Road and brought lots of people together doing interesting things um with psychedelic um graphics um definitely look, look, look up some of what he did it's beautiful um the shivananda um center was somehow less and even probably the beatles than in, uh yes absolutely with so the, the, with, the yeah, with maharishi start, and yeah yeah absolutely that's about the same time um you can't forget about them so it be, kind of became <laughs> both mainstream and a mark of an alternative person in a different mm. way and that's kind of from i think that's from like 66 67 onwards um and people were were definitely doing um yoga as mantra yoga as spirituality um in all sorts of ways um yeah The Shivananda classes came from North America. There were two um women in um Britain who were airline well well the one I spoke to was um oh let me get her, her name. <laughs> ah okay so it was Judy Tobler who was an airline attendant who brought Shivananda yoga to Britain. And she encountered um her first yoga class in Los Angeles in 1969. Um 
and her guru was Swami Satchidananda, who was taught by Shivananda. And she went to um, Balmoran in Canada and got training and then came back to London and invested her savings of um, which she had accumulated being an airline attendant, which was quite a well-paid job at the time and glamorous job, um, into creating a, a Shivananda yoga center in London. Um, and this was much more of a commune. And they did teach asana classes, um, but it was much more, you can see in the pictures, it was much more flowing, less precision, um, and um, more about a whole lifestyle and the whole teachings. Mm. Um, mm. And the early Shivananda Center was very much a happening and in incorporated lots of people and lots of influence because they didn't have a moment of like it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then after a few years, Canada said, oh, wait, um, let's send over a resident Swami. Well, it was quite important. And, uh, and, and Judy followed her um, guru uh, to South Africa eventually through um, maybe Meritrius. Um, I might be getting this wrong. It's in my book. I've, I've cross-referenced yeah. it. <laughs> um but that was that was interesting um you get 3ho and um uh yogi bhajan um about the same time in the counterculture you get the, lots in the of 70s. Some, in the, in the early 70s right. yeah yeah um, so where did it i mean where did it go from sorry i was just sort of thinking like it was so popular at that time and then it's like the 80s it just kind of got forgotten again and then at a certain point like you know that kind of madonna got on board and it kind of had this resurgence right what happened no, between that time and, and this and the kind of the heyday of the, the yuppie in the 80s? Do they just kind of like forget about well, it? Well, I mean, what happened was was Margaret Thatcher pulled the funding. Ah. <laughs> Thatcher, we can always blame so Thatcher, the, can't we? The... Yeah. <laughs> so, so she like yeah. pulled, the, pulled the rug out of the local education did. authorities um, yeah. and adult education. Um, and then it took, and then you had Jane Fonda, who... who is, yeah, um, and kind like of the, the whole this is this is yeah. the new yeah, aerobics, uh, yeah. uh, kind of exercise and keep fit. Um, a lot of a lot of overlap between keep fit teachers and yoga teachers in Britain, actually. Um, and Jane Fonda is actually fascinating because she gets. Um, if, I read her autobiography, and she gets people writing in about how her exercise changed their life in much the same way. You get people who hmm. write into the yoga journals about these practices changed my life in so many profound ways um and then you get so so it looks like yoga disappears in the 80s but there's still a handful of classes there's there's the establishment of um Iyengar centers um in manchester and london which have premises um shivananda um gets its own premises as well so it, it kind of goes into these more localized um uh niche centers mm. for a while in the 80s ymca um i'm not you know i'm not sure how influential that was in britain or mm. not i've not actually been to their archives that would be someone else could could do that and prove me okay um, there you prove go. my story wrong um, i know it was influential in there. america the ymca yeah yeah, um, yeah 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 um and yeah so so all the subcultures were still there, but it looks like yoga disappeared and it wasn't mainstream and it wasn't popular. And things like Gandalf Scarvin collapsed because they were trying to be so alternative and no one got paid and everything was done on generosity that um, people wound up running off the money and they couldn't pay the rent and they couldn't hold it together. Um, so um, in the 90s, you see the you had a few things you had the um uh the kind of influence of ashanga vinyasa yoga which in britain came through john scott and derek ireland um mm. and it, it was a bit later than in america mm. um uh the first mention of uh, patabi joyce is actually in um in the 1970s and he's mentioned as a guru in Oh, what's his name? Do you know his name? That French guy. Uh, it's Belgian. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to cut. Andrew Van Lisbeth. On... Lisbeth. Yes. And, Andrew yeah, Van yeah, yeah, his book. Yeah, yeah. Pre Pranayama. Yeah. It's a Pranayama book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he doesn't He doesn't really get on in in Britain until John Scott and Derek Ireland pick him up. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and this, this was something that suited... Um, a, a new generation of people who were stuck in more sedentary jobs, um, I think. 
um, because it was very, as most of your listeners will know, <laughs> it's a very physical practice that's that's fun and also provides meaning to, to people's lives. Um, and then the um, uh, the the first commercial yoga centers were in the mid nineties and. I think um, Godfrey Devereux um, was the manager of one of the first ones where they were trying to open up. Yes, it was um, um, Yoga back Place, back. and he was. It was a. It was yeah. a collaboration between um, Shandor Remete, I think, and um, Godfrey. That's and, right. Um, and John, I think. I think John had a hand in it as well, and that was the first place I saw actually. Um, yeah, on Bethnal Green Road. Yeah, well, no, actually, it wasn't. It started off somewhere else, but then it moved to Bethnal Green Road. But it was an attic. And it moved. I think it was in. Um, oh, somewhere around. Um, Oh, where's it? Oh, God. I've been away too long. I can't even remember places now. <laughs> <laughs> North sure London, anyway, North East London, there. somewhere yeah. not that far away. <laughs> uh, it'll, come, it'll come to me. Um, um, yeah, Clerkenwell. It was around there. I was going to say bike courier, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think so. I, I could look it up, but this this is less. I've done more on the early. Early yeah, session. yeah, yeah. Um, what about before? So, I mean, you know, I know, I know it's a going kind to of overstretch you or, or the podcast, but have you done a lot of work on on um, teachers and what we call gurus and um, more, you know more recent um, mm-hmm. and and older scandalous behaviour uh, without uh, you know being too licentious um, about all this? I mean, how has the um, how has the relationship changed maybe in re- involving these different um, reveals? to what we have today whereas i was mentioned to you on an email i think that the modern day yoga teacher especially in somewhere like tri yoga to to keep it english where i taught um is very much like a, a kind of glorified mate like you're a kind of friend right like, you know for well you know most teachers are along these roles you know in, but um it, it certainly wasn't that way with you know yenga who was as we talked also about uh called bankic slap uh, Yengar, you know, he was very much a fearsome guru, and uh, I don't know whether Brunton presented himself in that manner, or, you know. But there's certainly when it when yoga, you know, put its roots down, it was much more the guruship was much more eminent, right? And how how has that changed? And have you got anything to interesting to speak on about that? So. Um, well, it, it's kind of like anyone who studies social history kind of has the. Uh, what there's kind of nothing new or the more things change the more they stay the same time <laughs> um you, you see the same cycles um so on the one hand there was always a really strong um peer-to-peer um we're learning this together i mean you see that with the british wheel you see that and in fact the british wheel was very very anti-guru um and that was right. one of their objections okay. to anger was right, that you need right. to be your own guru and take right. as many teachers as possible um it sounds like today said it was whispered to me um not really whispered but kind of mentioned in passing by someone who knew the founder of the british wheel wilfred clark well that it was well known not to leave your daughter alone with him um <laughs> which is complete gossip and completely unverified but that's how things were before the internet age um and i think what has changed was the ability for people to say what happened to them and gather this kind of critical mass of support where allegations can be aired and not just um Mm. swept swept under the rug yeah um so i think that that has been a massive positive shift in international conversations about abusive behavior Mm. in the last 10 years say um but the problematic behavior and the matiness um, that the kind of guru authority and confusion about how much, how much should one submit and accept from a guru and this idealization of um, Asian gurus, both Buddhist and Indian as somehow more pure than the Catholic priests, um, uh, which we Mm. now know to be utterly wrong. And this is, this is some kind of fantasy. But but there is you you want um what was it um Geraldine Baskin who ran the Atlantis bookshop was very scathing about a lot of the um uh countercultural yoga figures pe- pe- people in the countercultural scene who were who were following people like the Maharishi um uh and saying oh they just were looking for another daddy um, whereas the real work is. Um, <laughs> is done in yourself and and in community um yeah and i suppose one thing to mention here also is that there was a huge influx of tibetans you know and, and tibet but tibetan buddhists gurus and lama basically lamas at this time right from from obviously the chinese invasion and and they 
very much set a precedent of guruship there, right? And also were then unfortunately often involved in, um, you know, kind of scandalous behavior around, around them. Yeah, so like Gerald York was very involved with um, Chogram Trumpa's um, immigration mm. to Britain and um, and then the first Tibetan monastery um, uh, was set up in Scotland in, in the later 1970s under his, his guidance. Sammy Ling, yeah. And yeah. He, he kind of eloped with a young Scottish woman, I think, or maybe she yeah. was English. Um, but the... So, so that was that was quite above the board. And then you had kind of Sogil Rinpoche coming in on his footsteps and he, he had his base in Britain for a long time, later moved to France. Hmm. Um, uh, there was a real desire to have access to these other, there still is a real desire to have access to um, the wisdom of inspired um visionaries of all sorts of of religious traditions mm. and it's quite difficult because sometimes um someone can have uh, access to some kind of really transformative truth and not always behave in an ethical way and and there's a point at which um that slips over to seeing that person as a complete fraud and it being hard to hard to take their teaching as um, anything other than uh, a, a kind of cynical attempt to manipulate people but mm. for a lot of teachers it's more just about they were um, they made mistakes and everyone um, wanted them to be perfect and I'm not trying to belittle or justify abuse but I just it, it's often difficult to tease out the stories um, and um, the networks of protection around people um so uh Iyengar, i know more about his um history in britain than than perhaps other gurus he he was very much um criticized by the british wheel for being too too much of a military drill too violent um to uh, to kind of contortionist um and several of his um senior students um like uh um broke away in the 70s in fact and did their own thing so that the people who went into more scary vela yoga um the farmers um and there was never really any um uh institutional repercussions um but people did did get injured sometimes by Iyengar's adjustments Iyengar's personal adjustments sometimes he got it wrong and there wasn't really a mechanism for discussing this and learning mm. from it within the organization yeah. and, don't imagine and there's you still could approach bks yeah <laughs> i don't think you would have been particularly receptive if you'd gone up to him and said oh I hurt my hamstring a bit but then, you know the funny thing is obviously krishmacharya kind of like um tore his hamstrings <laughs> in a famous Absolutely. demonstration didn't um, he um yeah uh, and one of the things i think was interesting about the local education authority and this this, this drive to make yoga safe uh, is mm. that how much of the transformation happens in those areas which are not quite safe and how do we keep how do we keep the potential for change um i mean we, we don't change that much if we go through a jane fonda workout um on mm. telly from the 1980s um and and some of those relationships there there is there is something slightly dangerous about them and that's kind of what mm. makes them work and how, mm. how do you keep how do you keep that edge without diving into abuse and how do you negotiate the edges of your ability and understanding without um going into areas you wish that you never went mm. or were forced upon you in ways that were completely mm. inappropriate um like it's mm. a hard question any ideas not one question <laughs> um oh, i don't have a solution but i think it's i think it's a question to keep open mm. um yeah many people will want... say that chogam trumpa was you know incredible as a as a person <laughs> right and his his virtuoso mannerism was that he was able to kind of insert himself so so greatly into western culture whilst maintaining the traditional teaching he had was so greatly that he obviously ended up a victim of his own success as it were as an alcoholic and, and a mm. womanizer um but you know he you know according to many and, and even reading his books he was an, you know it's an incredible um thinker 
at least for the very least absolutely um and and with some of these guru figures you get some of them are um you, you, you have a feeling that they tainted everything they touched but others you really get a sense if you talk to the people who came into contact with them that different people had very different experiences and very different relationships with the same people and mm. um and there's not one um one experience that any guru or or teacher no. gives um which also makes it problematic to deal with all the messiness and the stories that come out. So you think nothing's changed? Do you think it's just a recycling or do you think, you know, <laughs> that things have evolved and like just to wrap this conversation up since, since they came over to, you know, to outside India, first of all, have, have has modern yoga evolved in, the, in a skillful way? Or, you know, have you got any kind of parting thoughts about that or relationship to the teacher, um, to the practice as a whole, rather than the, the exclusive asana aspect that is now, more being the domain of the, of the yoga class? Um, the, I think, yeah, there's always continuity and there's always change. Um, and I think the internet has really changed things, um, both with enabling more horizontal communication, as well as um, so, so, so things mm. like the Me Too in yoga, um, finding, um, but also finding niche teachers within your own home. So if you're interested in alternative teaching and a body positive yoga, it's actually easier to find now than it was 10 years ago. Um, so, so that's one thing that's changed. Um, I think that the things have gotten, things are getting safer, um, which in general is a good thing. Um, you, you have certain standards of, of expectations in terms of a lack of injury. Um, you feel like you, you, you nice. shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, there's at least this, this like legal assumption that y you can hold your your studio or your teacher liable if they they injure you, and to some extent that might be unrealistic because everyone has things in their body they might not know they have. So there there is a sense of risk with any physical activity, and we don't expect say impact sports to be risk free. But so so we're getting a more cultural understanding of yoga is not this perfect panacea that's never going to hurt you and always going to save you um it, it, it's a messy activity like any other human activity we do mm. um uh and i think that's have, that they, have you know i mean I, through your research do you know of any um successful legal actions against yoga teachers in the uk for example because I, I can't imagine that anything has ever got through because it's not easy to prove really you know so it'd be an interesting kind of question I don't know, and it's certainly not. Yeah, a big I thought issue maybe you'd know. The US. Right. Um, I don't know of any successful cases, but I do know that having insurance is something that people are concerned you about. You have to have. And yeah, yeah, very much. So. Yeah. 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 Um, which, of course, is is, is new and um, uh, probably is from the nineties. In fact, um, they probably didn't. There wasn't the the kind of liturgical framework before mm. that. Mm. I guess something else that's both changed and stayed stay the same is the way um, in the 1960s, particularly the British wheel was searching for true yoga. And there was this idea that there is, there is a true authentic um, kind of uh, golden egg we can uncover and find. Yeah. And, objective. Um, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. on the one hand, I think that people, are still caught up in looking for true yoga. Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot more information about the complexity and diversity of the yoga tradition throughout history. And I, like a lot of the people you've talked to have, have been mm -mm. involved in uncovering that, that historical diversity. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of a, a more exciting place to be in than, uh, say a hundred years ago where it was really limited you had a few translations you thought that these were authoritative texts you didn't know people from the place um and so i think we're in a really exciting time where we as um as scholars as practitioners um have to be really um uh self self-regulating and exploring um what are we doing with our bodies? What are we doing with our minds? Um, and what are the practices and why do they work? What, what are the practices that work and why do they work and who can we learn yeah. from? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't I think, think the answer is, is going to a true yoga, but it's, <laughs> it's more interesting and more complicated.
Yeah, I think it's a great point to end with, actually. Um, it took a while to search for it for, um, in you, but I, mean, I think it, you brought out a perfect um, point, that the fact that you've got autonomy now. And previously you had this idea that you could somehow find something that was the thing that, you know, that, you know, un unveil the, the real experience. And now it's like with people like, uh, Mark Singleton and other scholars putting it out there. Anya, you mentioned Anya and, uh, you know, other people showing that, you know, yoga is this kind of diverse kind of tradition. That's never been just one thing. Right. And a lot has changed and, you know, it changed when it came over from, from, you know, India and it changed when it was in India, you know, and so, mm, uh, yeah, it's I still think changing. Yeah. And it's an evolution. You're so, changing I mean, it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we all are together um but yeah it, as you say it's an exciting time um maybe maybe the, the the kind of mystique and the kind of um the hopes for enlightenment maybe aren't aren't so you know so much there anymore but i think maybe more pragmatic maybe more pragmatic approach now yeah and i i think the interesting um overlaps with biomedicine I'm, uh, that's another strand we didn't talk about that I, i've been mm. doing work on um but uh, yoga for health and well-being and um, looking at the kind of movements in medicine to look at um, more positive psychology and what what are the practices and qualities that lead to a happy and fulfilled life that might be more in balance um, with with the planet and that kind of thing. I think I think yoga actually has a lot of potential there um, and needs to be better articulated and understood not as this mystifying mystical truth but as a as a series of um practices and techniques that really work for people for various reasons mm. um well <laughs> that'll do for now i think that's a, been a great chat okay and, um, yeah <laughs> thanks for thank you know, i i think we could continue in many directions but we'll leave it there and, and say thanks suzanne for coming on um yeah been, been a wonderful chat. Thank you.